What the fuck is up, Thought Gamer Nation? It's your boy. <laughs> Darkwood is a Polish survival horror game developed and published by Acid Wizard Studios in 2017 for PC, and ported to PS4, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch in 2019. It was created over the course of four years and by three untested developers. Originally planned as a simple tower defense game, gamers got their first look at Darkwood after a pre-alpha gameplay video was uploaded in 2013, and since the reactions were so positive, it warranted the team to move the goalpost. Since people were going to be looking at it, maybe it might as well be a, a competent, full-size game. This trailer, though very different from the finished product, immediately displayed a promising competency in design and atmosphere. It was downright plucky. There was a trash-talking sentient generator, an old spooky house, a dead kid, cool physics, a dead child. With a renewed sense of confidence, the team started an Indiegogo page to finish the game, which was successful. But expanding the scope of its production led to them overshooting their release date and spending all the money they got from crowdfunding. In order to finish Darkwood, the game would be posted on Steam in early access. Reviews during this phase were difficult for the crew, because even though they were actively working to complete the game, they had to wade through highly critical and less than insightful reviews as the game was not finished yet. But to be fair, Steam Early Access had yet to, and many would say, has still yet to produce many quality, full, completed games. So it was met with pretty reasonable cynicism. Still, reviews could have been a little bit more constructive than played for 10 minutes, got lost in the woods with a useless map, deleting it this game's fucking dumb as shit boo Pfft. 1980s pixelated graphics tried playing for 10 minutes couldn't take it anymore a simple bird's eye view gta like game that should be a fucking simple free to play damn this is boring upon its official release however it was a bit of a hit the mostly positive reviews came pouring in and the dedication of acid wizard seemed to pay off well enough to port the game to other consoles as well it's kind of weird talking about a game that most people liked you know it, it goes against my whole uh shtick i'm working with but i guess sooner or later i gotta play games people like you know i got real mixed feelings about the rest of humanity so their video game preferences are generally suspect on top of this successful release was a generally reassuring openness from the development team something that even indie developers seem to struggle with you have these guys who chose to release a full copy of darkwood onto torrent sites so at the very least people would play the game and also as a fuck you to key reselling sites that's a nice thing people People like nice things. It makes me want to buy a game. Nice things. Being nice to the people who are going to potentially buy your game? It doesn't sound that crazy, does it? Darkwood presents a surreal story that is shrouded in a fog of mystery. You may glimpse a shape or a silhouette somewhere in there. Fuck off. But you won't detect much that's concrete. Acid Wizard has cited influences such as David, they're still warm, they're very warm as a matter of fact, Lynch, Soviet Russian science fiction authors, Slavic folklore, and sleep paralysis nightmares. And you can feel all of that. But it's also disorienting and distinct enough that I don't feel the need to harp on these similarities. If like if you Google what in the ever living gosh darn heck of a fucking dang ass frick is up with the plot going on in this here uh what do you call it uh come on now i just had it video game called darkwood well you get this but you're not gonna find bullet points saying x and y happened which resulted in z what you will find is a number of posts where fans have cobbled together facts names dates events and then speculation on how this information is interconnected some of this sounds pretty solid but there are large swaths of darkwood that i don't think anyone has an answer for and that's okay so darkwood takes place in a dark Wood. I didn't think I'd say that so soon. It, it takes place in a, in a mysterious forest somewhere in the Eastern Bloc, 1980s. Doesn't have to be Poland, but I figure that's what they know. A place where everything is about to happen, but never actually does. It opens with a doctor brooding, lamenting his inability to save the forest people from a plague and their perceived ungratefulness for even attempting to. This is a desperate man at the end of his rope, and it's clear when he kidnaps a wounded stranger he finds while out looking for gas, carrying him back to his home and tying him to a chair, hoping to get information out of him concerning the only thing that matters to him now, 
escape. Seeing as this stranger had a key on him uh, and made his way this deep into the forest, he has to know how to get out of it. Passing out from a solid beating at the hands of the doctor, control is handed off to this new nameless mute character who frees another man the doctor has captured and is attacked by him, before several creatures break into the house causing you to black out. This is our protagonist for the rest of Darkwood, and to make things easier, I'll refer to him as Hat. Man, a traveling trader happens by Hatman and takes him to a relatively safe hideout. His first instinct is to run to the tunnel he came from to see if the doctor made his way out of the forest using his key, which he didn't because he never got a solid answer out of Hatman as to its location. What's pretty apparent by now is the nature of this forest. It's not normal by any stretch. Clues found in burned out buildings, hallucinations, and general environmental imagery reveal that the forest itself is something of an invasive organism. It it appeared where there was no forest and then rapidly expanded over a large area, all the while consuming and twisting any form of life that was either there initially or came after in a research and rescue mission of sorts. Presumably that is where the Doctor and other characters including Hatman came from, but as well as mutating and disfiguring everyone to be living Francis Bacon paintings, the forest has wormed its way into people's minds and driven them to forget a lot of things. The sentience of the forest has cut off all roads to the outside outside world with endless, unnavigable vegetation. Within is a mercilessly hostile environment where mutated hybrid creatures prowl around, bands of savages raid homes, the floor is lined with poisonous mushrooms, and it seems like not even death can truly stop you from a long, torturous fate. All of this peril is ramped up significantly once night falls, requiring the hat man to barricade himself in his hideout with any means possible until dawn. So while keeping a tight schedule and looking out for supplies, to get through the day, he scouts around the area looking for the doctor to get his key back or just a way out of this dark, dark woods. <laughs> this puts you in the path of several colorful characters, but I guess they, they're all kind of the same sort of muddy brown and black color, but their personalities are really interesting. Like Piotrek, an eccentric tinkerer who you help build a spaceship, or the musician boy who wants you to help him win the affection of a pretty lady that he plays music for and watches through a hole in her wall. This guy, along with the wolfman, represent two distinct paths you could take that lead to different events as they both want access to this pretty lady. There is a strong moral ambiguity to your actions in this game. You don't quite know whose side you're on, or if you've actually been behaving villainously this whole time. Yeah, much like Tinder, this game is really good at making me do things I don't fully understand, but I know I feel remorseful and ashamed of. The forest and its exact properties take a page from Stalker's zone, and just sort of exists this way, and works however the plot needs it to work at any given moment. There is a confidence and competence of world and atmosphere. They go out of their way to fill it with distinctly Polish ideas, and though it's often a stretch, it is really interesting to see the parallels between the nightmarish world of Darkwood with actual Polish folklore. There are shadowy, spirit-looking creatures that drain your life if you stray away from a light source, and that could perhaps be inspired by the Zmori, which is more or less a demon-like personification of nightmares that appears at night and feeds on your life force, looking mostly like a transparent human figure. And fittingly enough, these creatures were also attributed as the cause of sleep paralysis. They also just really don't like horses, which brought to mind that Fuseli painting, The Nightmare, because that depicts sleep paralysis and also has some heavy horse vibes. Also, I had just assumed that the etymology of Nightmare had some association with horses, but Mare is derived from a Scandinavian term for a spirit that suffocates you in your sleep. Uh, at this point, I'm just curious how much more irrelevant information I can pile onto this thought. Uh, but it's all fucking connected, man! In any case, the Polish DNA running through this game is really distinct and charming. Uh, since I already made it a thing with the last video that I talk about the ending, I feel obligated to continue to do that, so if you plan on playing the game, you can skip to this time. Uh, you know, you, you try to shield people from spoilers, but that only upsets uh, those that want the spoilers, so either way, I'm fucked! But also, I gotta get this video to 40 minutes somehow, so, uh, so I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what you want me to do. But uh, we're, go we're gonna talk about the ending, and I'll give you a minute just to uh, figure out how important this is to you. I'll check some emails or something.
Yep, still don't use these. Okay, so by siding with either the Wolfman or the Musician, you will find your way to an unlocked tunnel leading out of the forest. Inside, we come across a man who is seemingly stuck in a torturous state of undeath, who recounts his memories of dying, which sounds like he was wounded or infected in some way, and his pals tried to spare him further agony by shooting him in the head. Clearly that didn't go as planned because his gelatinous form is eternally fused to the ground, but it's a fun hint at what is to come. The tunnel opens up in the middle of a swamp that is clearly just an extension of the forest's blight. There are two paths one could take at this point, either investigating the radio tower in the west side of the swamp, or talking to a crippled villager to the north. Either of these directions could lead to the road home, the way out that the hat man keeps a photo of. Since I went to the villager first, this guy hangs out around a massive tree composed of chattering corpses that is blocking the way. The crippled man is the only person left in the crumbling ruins of this village as everyone else has been assimilated into the tree. He wants you to burn it down so he can finally get some rest. So we burn it down. After waiting out the night, the tree is burned enough to reveal a path to the road home. Walking down it, we are greeted by a variety of calcified remains in various positions of desperation. Like innumerable people were just frozen in amber on their way out. We even see the crippled man crawling his way down it. What follows is, in my opinion, the most effective and impactful moment of Darkwood, which is a suffocating thicket of trees until we are are able to breach the tree line and we see a field. We see telephone poles. There is a palpable relief at the sight of modernity. I felt genuine relief, like I didn't have to constantly check my six with my weapon readied. The hat man is home. He walks into his apartment building, he's greeted by his dog, a note is left for him telling him to warm up some soup, but all he wants to do is finally sleep. While Hatman gets some much deserved rest, we get a rundown of the fates of the other characters. And in this moment, I felt sort of empty, uh, more so than usual, and the first thought in my head was, well, that's an ending. I don't know, I, I guess I thought there was, there was more to this, but that's the end. That's just the end of the game. Only if you're a casual fake you got the fake ending the one specifically designed to pacify your complete lack of epicness if you take your time to explore the apartment building the basement in particular it's clear that something is really off about this place the tension starts to creep back in returning to your apartment you'll find roots growing around your TV set so you start moving furniture around and prying up floorboards finding a trail of tree roots leading to your bed shoving it aside reveals a hole that we jump through hat man comes to sans hat sans anything <laughs> and I mean anything Oh, sorry. Inside a what appears to be a massive labyrinthine tree. The one I thought we burned down, but I think this is a different, much bigger tree. I think I just got confused with my trees. I'm sure someone in the comments will, will clear that up and p part of me will be satisfied to know the answer, but a much larger part of me will completely resent you for correcting me. I, I won't say it, but that that's what's happening. <laughs> Within this tree, there is a large glowing ball of light that other naked and delirious figures seem to be either worshipping or just writhing about in its presence, muttering to themselves about something important or comforting to them, affirming our return home for what it is, a screen memory tailor-made to tempt Hatman into this sentient ball's influence, and everyone else in this tree is stuck in their own pleasant memory while the orb turns them into jello. This being attempts to lull Hatman back into the memory of his apartment, but he manages to regain composure and pull away from it. One of the bodies found around the orb is a minor character, until now only referenced once or twice, uh, that Hatman most likely knew previous to them being mindfucked by the forest and this telepathic tree ball. Which I was elated that this came full circle because they totally set up Chekhov's flamethrower early on, and I was waiting for it. And boy did that pay off. During the final moments of the game, you march throughout the tree, setting all of it on fires, the sleepers, the orb, all of it, draped in a cleansing fire, and unavoidably, Hatman himself. Like the other ending, we find out how our actions affect the rest of the forest. I, I feel like both endings are viable, both are appropriate enough ways to conclude this story, and honestly, I didn't expect to understand and know as much as I did by the game's end. It's a solid, tidy little story that 
feels larger than it is and it feels lived in. My only criticism is one that is totally a personal quibble and certainly not one that ruins the story for me. My thing is that the part of the story that hit me the hardest was the moment we leave the forest. That's the one thing I really felt and I would have loved if through some rearranging the story ended in that moment. Going back to a tree and burning it down again was a note we already hit so even though it's bigger and we get more exposition it didn't move me as much as this moment. I already burned down a tree. Why couldn't I burn down this tree first and then we escape the forest? I don't know. It's it's not often I really feel emotions, full stop. It's not often I get a real reaction from a game, so I tend to focus in on that and put importance on that. Though I can't feel a note of catharsis in burning down the tree, I, I think that's just because it feels good to burn things down. It's charming and it's brief if you don't count all the time you spend hiding in your house. Feeling somewhere lost in a Venn diagram between an acid trip, a fever dream, and a Soviet fairy tale. It's certainly far better than a first time devs tower defense game story has any right to be. The characters and world get fleshed out far more than I expected them to. It being a game of Slavic origin, I guess I just assumed it would be far more cerebral and open ended, but it tells a rather complete feeling story. Just dripping wet with dour, dreadful atmosphere that is persistent throughout every moment, with the exception of the times the gameplay becomes tedious. But I'll talk about that a little later down the line. The joke was that I'm gonna talk about it right now. I'm sorry, I'm not at the top of my game right now. Darkwood is a game somewhat removed from my wheelhouse. You know me, I like pointing and clicking on things. I like stabbing and shooting on things. But games with survival and crafting elements have never appealed to me. It might be a boring cop-out reason, but I don't like feeling overwhelmed and stressed. Keeping myself fed and under a roof is already a daily miracle that I somehow keep pulling off and I don't need that simulated for me. So my experience playing this game had an added layer of tension because I'm not good at handling these kind of mechanics. I get worn out and frustrated rather quickly. So in describing this, if I sound bitter or overly critical, it's, it's because I'm a, I'm a casual walking simulator apologist. Bring on that very easy mode, Hideo. In fact, fuck it, just make a movie. Just forget games altogether, I don't give a shit. It's all coming down anyway. The prologue with the doctor not only sets up the world and the tone of this game, but it also functions as a tutorial, though hardly a comprehensive one. The first thing that captured my eyes was the field of vision your character has. In a clever move to preserve tension and uncertainty, you can only see enemies, and items, and finer details of the environment when your cone of vision is facing it. I'm sure there are better examples, but I'll, I'll use any opportunity I can to talk about Nox. So, it's a lot like Nox, but it takes the idea a little more literally. Also, go watch my video about Nox. Nox. You start out, as you will after every death you experience, unless you're playing on nightmare mode. On the floor of your hideout, you're gonna wanna light your stove. The stove ties you to this hideout, as there are a few more throughout the forest and you're probably gonna wanna go back to the one with all your shit. The stove is also where you can cook poisonous mushrooms and meat and distill it into some kind of hallucinogenic soup that you shoot into your veins and gives you abilities, like being able to see in a 360 arc for a minute or being able to eat wood. Though with every ability you unlock, you are also required to select a penalty ability, like uh, not being able to run so good or you just being an asshole. You could play this whole game without fucking with any of that really, but hey, on to the important stuff. Get the fuck off the ground, game. Time's wasting, here's the deal. I don't know how to put this any other way, but they'll be coming soon, and you need to prepare. Come nightfall, they will descend on you. And even if you are ready, the odds of you surviving the night, perhaps I shouldn't say. Your little house, it ain't gonna cut it. You got open windows, you got doors missing. They're gonna cut through this like me in a case of Mountain Dew Kickstart Orange Citrus. Available now on Amazon.com. Amazon.com, don't feel too bad, someone's gotta do it. So, minutes are seconds, and you gotta get out there and collect as much as you can to haul back here and fortify your house, all the while, you know, trying to proceed in the plot and avoid enemies along the way. Or don't, you can fight them, but keep in mind the creation and upkeep of weapons pulls from the same resources you need to board up your windows and make traps. Melee weapons have a real short lifespan and will probably only make it through a few enemies before needing to be repaired. There are some single use guns that you can find or construct along the way but I never found this to be a very worthwhile investment so I wound up trading them. The trader appears at the start of every day and offers you a lot of the essentials you're gonna need but nothing that you couldn't come across in the wild. If you do happen to survive the night you are rewarded with credit for 
for purchases from the traders, so there is a decent incentive to try to stay alive. I'd imagine anyone playing this is going to develop their own playstyle, but I found myself focusing on accomplishing one substantial interaction for a quest, and then spent the rest of my time preparing for the night. Boarding up windows, making sure the generator has gas, setting up what traps I could spare to make, making sure my weapons are in decent condition, and I have bandages or a torch if the need arises. It's gonna be difficult trying to gauge the time of day until you get a watch, which I recommend making that your first big purchase. It is invaluable to managing your time. I mean, it also added stress for me because now I have a fucking clock looming over me and, and I'd frequently just call it at like 6 p.m. Like, fuck it, there's no time, I have to prepare. Once night falls, a randomly generated assortment of attacks will happen and you have to survive it until daylight. While this may seem manageable the first few nights, Darkwood seems to understand when you've learned how to do something and then immediately takes that power away from you. No matter what variation of strategy I would try, I never really felt like I was on top of it, and was for sure going to make it to 8am. I had a surprising amount of success, not even bothering keeping my generator going and just sitting in the corner with a torch ready if I needed it. Other times, I would be overly confident and waste an egregious amount of resources protecting myself, and then a fucking near impossible creature to kill would just pop out from under the floorboards. The night is an important and defining part of Darkwood, and it's really effectively tense and frustrating and challenging for a while. In the same way some have described a relationship with me, it was really good for a while, but the more you experience it, the more the magic starts to wear off and you reach a place where it feels like an annoyance, an obligation, a burden even. And there are other more interesting things you could be doing that probably don't eat out of the trash or read monster harem manga. Of a covert military unit in the area. I felt that tension start to slip when I found myself weighing the importance of surviving the night as things became routine and the game had thrown every trick up its sleeve at me. And even though time does start to move progressively faster at night, it did feel like there was a good while where I would just set myself up and then step back and wait for something to happen. A lot of the mechanics of this game are unforgiving and brazenly unexplained or unwieldy. And this is clearly by design and something that's either gonna click with you or isn't. It's the same passion for masochism you'd see with Pathologic or a Dark Souls game. You're either gonna be hardcore enough for it or uh, you're gonna piss yourself. Combat is slow and weighty, your stamina and weapon durability drains very quickly while your enemies seem to never tire, you could walk on the wrong kind of mushroom and fuck your whole day up, you could spook a banshee and then it calls all its little bird babies and then you get cornered and stun locked until you just have to watch your health slowly get pecked away, powerless to complete any kind of action. Like they do a lot to fuck with your sense of security and while it does make me feel tense and in danger, for me it diminishes a lot of the work or time I put into it. You really do have to break the programming that other games instill where you must engage with every enemy and loot every house, when sometimes the wiser option would be to just save your weapons and your pills like, you ain't going anywhere, you can always come back later. It opens with a disclaimer warning that you are playing a challenging and unforgiving game. You will not be led by the hand, respect the woods, be patient focus. And you know, a lot of people like to hear that. They like to know they are being given a worthy challenge to overcome, and I can respect that. I do think it's stupid though. Nah, I'm just playing. But when I saw that text, I, I just thought, respect the woods. Ooh, I'm so scared. Fuck me. God damn it. The moments that really shined for me were when the time would stop and the game would focus on the plot for a bit. Every time it happened, I couldn't help think the whole game could be like this. Like, what if I didn't have to go back before nightfall and stress about boarding up my house? Like, what if I just kept going? You know, it didn't ruin my experience, but this game has an immensely enjoyable world and atmosphere, and they do some really effective things with it. The first night... Spine tingling! The first time a chomper bursts out of a dead body? That wave of confusion and panic? This is a little specific one, but you can travel to different areas of the map by a network of tunnels. And the first time you see these, uh, there's just a glowing pair of eyes in one of them telling you that these are his holes. And there was something almost adorable about it, like, aw, oh, this guy likes his little holes. And then later on, uh, they just casually show what the guy in the holes looks like. And my reaction was so visceral, like I, just immediate discomfort. Like, oh, well, I'm just gonna get the fuck out of here. Time to go. 
Lamias are only gonna be okay in certain situations, and a haunted forest is not one of them. I loved how this game feels, I just, I don't want to craft things and defend my house. I just want to wander around and get spooked and kill things. At a certain point, that terror fades into frustrating management. I become less scared that the ghoulies are coming to get me, and more pissed off that they found me like a heat-seeking missile and broke all my shit. I should be saying, oh no, they got into the living room, and not, god damn it, now I gotta waste gas sawing more planks of wood and spend money on nail. The combat is one of the more criticized elements, but I'm fine with it once you get the timing down and understand what certain enemies are gonna sap from you. I feel like you could stand to be rewarded more for killing them though, or just in general, I like feeling like a good boy. I'll admit it's not ideal, and it is kinda awkward the way you move with WASD but look directionally with the mouse. It can be bothersome. Exploration feels good, and I like that you have to navigate by landmarks. All the characters are fun to interact with, and trying to, you know, pick apart what they're up to. It's just the rest of the survival business is not working for me. I wouldn't even rule out those things entirely because I've liked other games that use crafting, but it feels oppressive in this one like it's just it's just not what it should be and I can only handle oppression for so long I still have pathologic 2 PTSD the second I emptied an entire clip into a banshee and it didn't even flinch I was right back there back trying to know the lines trying to become her damn you just go buy that fucking game support arts Hey, you buy this one too. I'm, I didn't mean to overshadow this one. You know what I mean? For what Darkwood is, I think it looks very charming. The team at Acid Wizard clearly have a very talented eye for design. They managed to make a retro pixelated game with a bird's eye view look really unique and creepy. It's not technically impressive, but I found it to very effectively instill a sense of dread, and there were several visual moments that gave me pause, like following a trail of hybrid snail people wallowing in misery that leads to a giant snail crushing a house, the Dolly-esque nightmare that is the sow that villagers have opted to worship and that I accidentally killed. I, I didn't know. It told me to press the buttons. I just, I, I, it was, I was just doing what it told me to do. I guess it told me not to, but I assumed it was using reverse psychology. All of the characters you exchange dialogue with have these gorgeous animated profiles. The look of everyone in this game is slimy, anemic, like their skin is just mush dripping from them, and they're dressed in an ugly assortment of rags and repurposed objects. It's unmistakably Polish, immediately channeling imagery from Beksinski paintings. But just about the only issue I have with the way this game looks is there were several times I passed by an important item because I just couldn't distinguish it from the environment. Looking at a simplistic landscape from above and low localizing that to a, a small cone of white makes it easy to come away from a location thinking you've got all you needed out of it. So we're done here. It's consistently surprising how capably this game weaves its atmosphere with this perspective. I think a lot of what makes this work, for me at least, is how unnerving the dark is. Light plays an important role in the gameplay and it's often very scarce and comforting when you have it. You're taught that straying away from it is bad and that it doesn't end well, so when you unexpectedly lose it, it's quite alarming. A big part of what makes the dark scary can be attributed to sound design. The first few nights in Darkwood really got to me, especially since I had no idea how the game worked and what they would throw at me. There is something pure about that initial experience, where I was just standing in the middle of a room I, I had boarded up and thought, all right, well, what happens now? In this moment, anything could be out there, and the slightest out-of-place creak in the floorboards or shuffled footstep or breath had me saying, in the immortal words of Scuba Do, Ruh -ruh. The soundtrack is wonderful and fitting in a way that makes it seem so symbiotic, like I don't know how the soundtrack could be anything else. It's a great accompaniment to a dour, depressing post-apocalypse. A collection of dreamy, somber, dirge-like ambience, if that's a thing, I don't know anything about music. It's like the memory of music, the ghostly echoes of it that are fading away, becoming forgotten or consumed by a sentient tree. Uh, hey, you'd know if you play the game, it makes sense then. The way percussion is used very sparingly, and when it is, it feels organic, like an organ in a deformed animal pulsating. That does things to me, and the use of vinyl record warmth and popping really just gives me an erection. I don't want to say that. I'm not going to say that. 
this is only my second time using this section of the video, so please don't tease me. And, uh, you know, now this is kind of awkward because I have mixed feelings about many things, but also strong, positive feelings. I don't know. We'll see what happens. This game's combat system is awful, making it unplayable. You'll die all the time because instead of swinging your weapon to attack, you'll start searching through some furniture. It really bothers me when people call something unplayable that I just played. Like, how did I just play it then? Don't diminish my accomplishment here. It's a hard game. You'll die all the time? You'll die all the time. I won't, because I understood the controls, you goob. I'm frustrated by this game. The first several hours of the game are psychological horror, but then in part two, it becomes a hand-to-hand -hand melee combat game. The combat system is one of those where you have to time your attacks while dodging in various directions, moving very fast. If, like me, you lack dexterity, you're screwed. I inevitably thrash wildly at the enemies and end up dying. I know I'm supposed to be able to beat these enemies, but that just ain't happening. It's frustrating because I would have liked to see the rest of the story. Firstly, there is zero hand-to-hand -hand combat, but no matter how vague it is at explaining how to play it, I think it's given you the benefit of the doubt that you'd figure it out within the 13 hours you played it. It's not like me to say something so gatekeepy because I'm not a great hardcore gamer, uh, as much as I am a glutton for punishment, I guess, but you gotta get good. 13 hours is enough time to figure out timing. It's one of those games where fights involve timing, because fights involve timing. Clunky controls, 90s era graphics, and bugs too. All this broke any immersion the game built. They also don't mention that there is content only available to people who pre-purchased the game on some ghetto Kickstarter thing. But they do make adding that content part of the new game menu, so you're sure to know you're missing out on something. People were sharing the code that allowed access, but of course it got deleted and censored ASAP. I usually try and support indie devs, but save your time and money with this one. It takes pretty much every bit of suspension of disbelief and imagination available to make this scary at all. Okay, uh, for starters, are you the real Emily Autumn? Like, fight like a girl Emily Autumn? Uh, if so, big fan. Uh, but this is a stupid review. 90s era graphics? The Unity engine did not exist in the 90s. Did you play games in the 90s? They didn't look like this. They look like this. Does this look like this? I don't think this looks like that. I did not encounter a single bug in my playthrough. Not discounting that there might be bugs, but certainly nothing in the several hours I played it. But I'm sure you came across many in the- Oh wait, what the fuck do you mean ghetto Kickstarter? You mean literally the second most popular and well-known crowdfunding site? And that content you're missing out on? Was just a sweet little thank you room for the people that helped fund the game. And a box that gave you a couple items so the beginning is more forgiving. How this is upsetting you is baffling to me. Like. You don't have to fuck with this. You didn't support the game. Special things for people who did was an incentive to support the game. Why would you, why would they make it easy for you to pretend like you did? Emily, stick to music. So much lags and bugs played on OS. Oh, well, I ain't gonna say it, but you know I gotta say it. Absolutely horrendous gameplay mechanics as a travesty of dark and gritty suspenseful horror game. What does that sentence mean? <laughs> the protagonist runs like a 70 yo single lung man with severe COPD. Resources are nowhere to be found. Oh cool, supplies. And the day night cycle is as fast as someone's PA time on the bed. Eh? The prologue was alright, but it was extremely frustrating to progress due to the horrid gameplay. Also, it gave me zero chills and surprises. This comes from a avid survival horror game fan as early as Alone in the Dark, Splatterhouse, Clock Tower, all Silent Hills and Fatal Frame. I don't need your fucking credentials, dude. Game didn't work for you. You don't have to you don't have to name other vastly different games. Don't be a weirdo. Meh. It would be great if it was not for the load stutter pause effect the game has every time a new place loads. Sound effects and so on. High end system. GTX Strand. Fuck off, you suck at computers. <laughs> Good atmosphere, but there just isn't much of a game there. Just boring to be honest. Get it if you like walking simulators or heavily story-driven experiences. What? I don't I don't think you made it past the prologue. Or know what a walking simulator is. Or a game. I give up! I can't stand the key binding, and my controller is even more difficult to use. Sorry for the negative, and sorry for purchasing this game. Very sorry indeed! I get the thing with the key binding and controllers. I mean, I don't because I, with very rare exceptions, prefer a keyboard and mouse, but I get that you could be bothered by that. I just think it's really relatable and sweet to apologize three times because you didn't like something that someone else made. I appreciate this review a lot. 
Darkwood is an impressive first outing from a small developer. It displays a natural flair for world building and design, though it's not a heavily story driven experience. Its story is really interesting and borrows from an excellent array of sources that I was already interested in to create something that they really make their own. In their AMA they did a while back, they expressed doubt as to whether their next project would even be a horror game, but if they wanted to, they could make this their aesthetic and improve and expand on it, and I think they could make a truly great horror game. They clearly understand what makes things frightening in a psychological sense without desperately trying to startle you. I do think there is much to improve on as far as gameplay. The repetitive nature of the crafting and tower defense loop causes a lot of the really effective tension to dwindle as you're put through the same demoralizing circumstances over and over. When I was out exploring, doing quests for characters and scavenging through old houses, I was really enjoying myself, but in the later portions of the game, I just kept looking up at the clock, dreading when I would have to stop having fun and have to go sit in the dark with a gun pointed at my front door. It could control better, apparently, that's a big deal to a lot of people, but I didn't find that to be too distracting. But the controls and somewhat cruel difficulty could alienate people that just want a spooky story to play through. I don't know if they did the best job at representing what you'll actually be doing for a good 80% of the game. And I do think you should know that just because, you know, it's painted up to be camouflaged in this grim, depressing world doesn't mean it's not at its core a survival game. So some might find it difficult to immerse themselves in its horror because that horror is broken up by crafting and inventories and resource management. This was a back and forth for me. I would get really into it and invested and have these really tense experiences, but then I'd have to deal with some survival stuff and that feeling would slip and then come back and then slip. It was a real roller coaster of enjoyment, but there were some great low points. I'm sorry, I mean low points as a good thing because I hate roller coasters. I don't like being up in the, in the, in the air. I can't criticize the look and feel of this game all that much aside from not being able to discern certain smaller objects from the environment. It looks great, existing in this pleasant middle ground between throwback and modern. The sound Sound and music does a lot of the heavy lifting for its tone as well. This is an odd game for me because I really enjoyed a lot of it, but I also can't fault anyone for quickly dismissing it and saying, you know what, this, this isn't my thing. Because I've done the same thing to other games that advertise as being difficult and unforgiving by design. That's not how you get my sale, but I know that is for many others. And throughout my time playing, I would die and I would shake my fist at the heavens and say something passive aggressive like, wow, this is fun, loving this. And like even when I finished and, and the credits were rolling, I was still just pissed off at this game. Like, that's all I could feel. And then by the next day, I was reading about the Switch version and thought, I'd play this on the Switch. This seems like it was made for the Switch. I think I'm gonna buy it on the Switch. I was completely on board with playing it again. So I think I do feel that rewarding sensation that fans of Dark Souls get. It's just that my brain doesn't understand how to tell me that. And it just comes out as anger, but it's really love, but it's expressed with pure rage. And that's not something I should tell people. What up? Special thanks to Ailing Uncle, Resurrection, this deal is getting worse all the time, Dark Raptor 86, Nazim Kamal Ure, News Time, Octo, Charles Marr, Karen Mayville, Game Master, Mr. Ben Jarming, and Bayard Brown for donating at the highest tier on my Patreon. I'm very exhausted and sweaty from yelling into this microphone in a small hot room. Uh, I hope that energy came out in the video and you could you could sense the, uh, the panic and the desperation, the, the yearning for release in it. Also the love and my and the appreciation for everything you help me do. Yeah, anyway, I hope you like the video. You're the best. Nobody is dead.